Well, today, everybody, thank you for, for stopping by and checking out our interview here. We are privileged to have Mark Clemenson with us today. Now, Mark is someone who I would say or describe his home life growing up as esoteric or otherworldly. And so he has a family history of being involved in the Freemasons and the Illuminati. And from a young child, Mark learned to practice transcendental meditation and uh, was levitating. And anyway, he will tell us more of the story, but there is so much involved in your history, your family history, Mark, uh, even a relation to Pope Clement, right? Clement. Clement. Um, okay. Yeah, my last name had changed uh, two times over the last several hundred years. Um, so it used to be Clement, and then it became Clement son, and then it became Clementson after that. Okay. Wow. okay. There's a strong family history there of the of secret societies. And Mark is going to share with us his testimony of having come out. Mark, I noticed when you share your testimony, you don't begin with your testimony. You talk about who you are in Christ today. Amen. And and then you lead us into why your message, your your testimony is so powerful and why it's important uh, incorporating the three angels messages. And so I just thought that was so beautiful and so different than what I typically see in people's testimonies. So, uh, yes. And what I'm going to do is for the viewers, I'm going to post a link to one of your presentations so that they can follow up and see uh, and watch your testimony in full with this background now it might be helpful to them too so i want to thank oh. you for joining me and for joining us so early in the morning we've made several attempts and um, i praise god that today seem things seem to be going really well yeah i think if we get up early in the morning we beat the network traffic out there on the world wide web oh yeah <laughs> Yeah, there's so much of that these days. So let's yeah. start with Freemasonry. Um, what exactly is a Freemason? Um, Freemasonry is a largest and oldest secret society in the world today. Um, in their own writings, the Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, they describe that the first master mason of the craft and the autocratic ruler in their words, was Nimrod himself. So they point back their historics to Nimrod as the founder and the first global uh, head of that uh, occult society. And from there, we see a number of changes and gyrations as it went through Earth's history. But Freemasonry of itself has stayed intact in two branches, the York Rite and the Scottish Rite. Uh, both of those are found uh, globally, and then there are other Prince Hall, there's uh, other Freemasonries for women as well. So a lot of splinter groups came off of the organization, and multiple um, happenings through history have also come off of the original foundation. And what it is, it's the idea, plain and simple, that you can tap into a inner power, a Luciferian power is what they explained it as, uh, light of the Lucifer, and to invoke this power to becoming godlike, uh, that you can, through your own means and your own direction, be as the gods, which we know is a complete fallacy to the word of God, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, the reason that Adam and Eve were thrust from the Garden of Eden and also why the beginning of death came into the world as well. Mm -hmm. So you said the Freemasons are the oldest society. Are they, are they older than the Jesuits? Oh, absolutely. They are? Uh, oh, because Nimrod, right? That, was, that takes us yeah. to um, building the Tower of Babylon, right? Yep. In, in, uh, in, on the plains of Shinar after the Great Flood that took place, uh, Nimrod decided to build a tower. Um, one was to uh, 
save themselves if a flood would ever occur again. But I believe that there was other reasons too that the tower was built. It was a place of worship, but it also was a opportunity to what they see as harness uh, cosmic power. Um, so they're very much uh, involved in this idea that there is power within the universe mm. that they can tap into. And by tapping into that, they become more collectively um, unified and also that they have the ability to um, take this power and harness it, make it grow as they include other persons who are involved in this society to bring about their changes, uh, their desired outcomes of what the their new world order would look like. Mm. Okay, so it's very strategic in nature. Yeah, I mean, when we know the biblical history, when uh, Lucifer was thrown out of heaven with the third of the host, uh, he was planning and has planned to set up his own government. So there are two forms of government, one which is not of this world, uh, as Christ said, if my kingdom were of this world, um, my servants would fight for me. But this is not, um, how do you want to say it? Uh, God's place is still here um, in control over his people, but the prince of this world has taken complete control over what he now calls his dominion because he was able to usurp that from Adam and Eve when they gave up their opportunity in the garden to serve God. Hmm. Okay. That's it's interesting, you know, when historically you look at that event um, where Adam and Eve were in the garden and, and Eve was tempted by the, the divining serpent, uh, which is also the same name for the Vatican, the divining serpent, mm -hmm. um, Quetzalcoatl, the flying serpent. Um, and she ate of it and gave to her husband. He did eat of it also. And their eyes were open and they knew that they were naked. If you read on in Genesis chapter 3, you find that um, they decided to f sow themselves fig leaves. Um, they were highly intelligent beings and they understood that uh, the light of the robe of Jesus and God had left them. And magnesium is in high concentration in the fig leaf. And so they thought that by putting fig leaves over them that they could then reinstate this aura of light around them. Really? Uh, God, yeah, God knew you know, what they had done, and so they, they sewed these fig leaves into aprons, and then we know from the account that there must be a sacrifice, and so that sacrifice included a spotless lamb, and then God took the skin of that lamb, and he made clothing for them. Uh, ironically, or purposefully, I believe, Freemasonry, with their Masonic apron, is made from lambskin. And so they use that as uh, a way of showing that they have received wisdom. It's called the apron of wisdom. And they use that to show that they have covered the holy of holies. So interesting that the, uh, their system is based upon, uh, at the core of it, it's, it's sexual perversion. Mm -hmm. And um, unfortunately, many told lives and innocent children have been part of that system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very sad, very sad indeed. Yeah, and you can see this explosion now with all of this uh, global cabal of satanic uh, trafficking of children, pedophilia, and we see it being exposed um, through Pizzagate and some other um, mm -hmm. late things in regards to Epstein and uh, the latest, uh, his social partner who's also been arrested as well. And we know that there were hundreds of people that took flights down to Epstein's private island. Mm -hmm. Some of them as notorious as, as Bill Gates and Bill Clinton, um, Prince of England over there. So a lot of uh, people have been roped into this uh, society as well through uh, the means of this trafficking and young, young adults. Mm -hmm. Very sad. Yes. It was previously thought to be conspiracy. But now they're finding that it's not, <clears> that it's very real. And so many missing children all the time, you know, it's just, it's tragic. But I'm glad that these things are being exposed now. But we know that um, until Jesus returns, these things will be. 
And so. Mm -hmm. It's going to get more challenging. Yeah. And it's going to get more moral decay within society. And that's why we need to stand by the bloodstained banner and by the side of Jesus at this point, because when they unleash their power against us, um, and we know through the biblical understanding is that the whole world is going to be deceived except for a very small handful of people. And um, just to kind of put things in perspective as a biblical Christian, you know, people ask me, you know, why do you put your faith in such a, a book that um, we see sometimes as being, uh, you know, full of fables. And, you know, I take them to the center text of the entire Bible, which you find in Psalm 118, verse 8. It's better to trust in God than to trust in man. And if we're going to be deceived, we're going to have to trust on God's word, and we're going to have to trust ourselves to his word and his word alone. Mm -hmm. And he also says that if, if you basically, if you want to believe a lie, I'll send you a deception. I'll, I'll send you a lie. And so Satan has woven many lies, many lies, and, um, and people walk in deception. And I know that Satan is very crafty, but we know that God is wisdom, and he sends us the Holy Spirit to provide that help that we need to discern. And... Um, yeah, there will be people that are being deceived and deceiving. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be going both ways. Yeah. And unfortunately, it's going to come into and has into all the denominations of the religious factions of the world today. And that's why we're in a time like never was where um, I'll say this, a denomination is not going to save you. No, it's going to be a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, your Savior. That's what's going to save you yeah. from the deception. Yes. And uh, yeah. it's coming. It is. And we know it comes down to a day which represents the, the, the person we worship, we honor. You know, so, um, yeah. boy, so many directions to go with all of this. This is heavy stuff. And, you know, people wonder. Why do we talk about such heavy things? Most people talk about God is love, He is forgiving, He is He is merciful, and He is all of these things. But because Satan is real and his lies are so deceptive, and they are meant to entangle God's people um, and to to steal them from the kingdom of God, we have to talk about these things. And we have different areas, but they both are rooted and grounded in the occult. Spiritual formation, emergent teachings, it all goes back to the occult when you follow that trail. And with you, with secret societies, more obvious when you start studying these things. So this is where we connect. You know, Satan has a hold in so many people's lives who so many are innocent and they don't understand what being a Freemason means. And as I understand it, even within Freemasonry, there are different levels. But within each level, some people know what they're involved in and some people don't. So Amen. I know that uh, <clears throat> you know, generationally, as my parents and my grandparents and so on before them were involved in this particular society, and then these apron of wisdom was basically passed down to me and that's when the Lord stepped into my life and I realized that there was a crossroad in regards to which way I was going to go both with my career, with my um, family and, and with my friends and my associates mm -hmm. and a decision was made uh, to send that apron back to my father. Wow. And I actually asked him to burn it. Um, and I think at that point he realized that I had completely made a decision to step away from this path and try to understand uh, what my role was in this coming new world order. Um, and unfortunately, within our particular denomination, we hear those who um, 
shout down the idea that there is a new world order, um, that there is a conspiracy, and that the Bible doesn't speak of these things. But in uncertain terms, it absolutely does. And we know through the pen of inspiration as being Adventists, the spirit of prophecy uh, opens our minds up very completely to the fact that there are conspiracies and confederacies. Mm -hmm. We're told that we are to study the mystery of iniquity. And in doing so, in the next statement of the comments from the pen of inspiration, she says, you will be looking at secret societies and confederacies. And those are the global elite mm -hmm. who are part of a cabal. And at the very top, you have the uh, Luciferian circle. Below it, you have the committee of 300. Below that, you have splinter groups that go into all different organizations, religious, political, uh, economic, uh, military, and each one is run just like it is a well-oiled machine. Uh, there is a famous uh, speech by John F. Kennedy that he uh, called out, and he said he was going to expose a ruthless conspiracy. And I think that that idea actually cost him his life, ultimately, that he realized that he was not going to find himself on the wrong side of the fence. And because of that, he was taken out of that system because he was an obstacle to what the plans have been since the time of his assassination. Mm -hmm. I would highly recommend for everybody to Google um, John F. Kennedy's speech on uh, the ruthless conspiracy and listen to it. And you will hear from the president of the United States mouth that he knew what was going on and he was willing to try to expose it. Mm. And in doing so, he paid dearly with his life. It silences dissenters is exactly the words he used in his speech. Mm. And we're gonna see that towards the end as the Elijah message goes forward. And God's Elijah messengers are gonna lose their lives because they're willing to step forward and say, there are people out there that don't know the truth and they need to know the truth and to come free from it and God gave me this experience in my life that I'm able to reach people who ultimately can't be reached by uh, a church member who has no experience in this world. Yeah. And I'm just so thankful that God has given me this opportunity to communicate literally around the world with people who have reached out to me and asked me, what can you do to help me or a loved one who's caught up in this type of stuff? And um, how can we use you know, God's power to release them uh, mm -hmm. from the snares of, of the devil. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a miracle that your life was spared, and we're going to talk about that. But I am so thankful. And um, I know that you get attacked for doing what you're doing, um, and, and you're willing to do it anyway. So thank you. And, you know, I pray for you. I pray for others who are doing this. And, uh, and I'm going to invite the viewers to do the same because we need those prayers, um, especially Amen. what you're doing. They are protective prayers, and God spared your life for a reason. And the reason is very much, I'm sure there's so much more, but very much what you're doing. So let's go back to how your family actually became involved in all of this. Um, I think back to your grandfather or great-grandfather, was it? Um, on my dad's side, my grandfather um, and grandmother made a decision to move from Great Britain to India as the British uh, royalty um, had their, not just their presence in India, but they had their political power um, as it was one of their, uh, the British Commonwealth and, and actually still is, it's under the British Commonwealth, India. And so, uh, my grandfather uh, was very involved in his career, and uh, he was involved with a lot of people in the aristocratic crowd, and became a member of a aristocratic white lodge in India. My grandmother was involved with the government side in the parliament, um, and what I've been told from my dad's experience and my uncle, who grew up, were born and grew up in India, and ultimately went to some... Uh, schools on the border of Tibet as they were going up through their academy uh, and grade school years. Um, they became in contact with, with a very uh, small group of very powerful people. 
and it was my grandfather's apron uh, that was passed down to my father, which was passed down to me um, as part of that. Um, and I did mention White Lodge, um, and people are going to kind of maybe wonder who don't understand mm -hmm. that there are different colors. Here in the United States, we see a majority of everything is a blue lodge. Um, there is some occasion for a black lodge. Uh, the Skull and Bones uh, Temple is a black lodge of a uh, form of Freemasonry. But the White Lodge in and of itself is a lodge that holds all of the light within it. So if you were to break the spectrum of white light, you would see all the different colors. So they're given all of the information uh, within the inner portico of the teachings. In the Blue Lodge here in the United States, um, they're only given a portion of that light. And it's through the degrees that you mentioned earlier, um, as people rise up in degrees, they're given more truth and less lies in regards to what they're actually involved in. Most men and women who get involved in the Blue Lodges here in the United States um, never get above the master. Um, very few get above the third degree. And it's really when you get into the third, 30th, 31st, 32nd, and 33rd, which is an honorary degree, the 33rd, that you start to understand at the core of it, it's Luciferianism. It's this idea of Prometheus bringing uh, the, the light of knowledge to mankind. And uh, unfortunately, there's different portions of uh, uh, horrendous um, occult activity uh, taking place in some of the lodges. And you can hear some of the testimonies of people, mm -hmm. uh, especially young women, who have been brought into lodges and have been raped, mm -hmm. uh, small children that have been brought into it as well. Um, so here we see different colors representing different portions of what you can entertain. And within Freemasonry, there's the idea, it's kind of like the yin yang in the Far Eastern teaching, um, which I branded on my body years ago because that was where I was headed is the, the teaching of the Tao and spiritualism and mixing that with metaphysics, the philosophy, understanding the base of, of, of things in general. And um, we see this balance between the good and the evil, the male and the female, the positive and the negative forces, the chi, which is required to keep things in balance. Mm -hmm. And so there are many within Freemasonry that at their inside, they're, they're good people and they're confused or they're just completely uh, deceived mm -hmm. in regards to what they're caught up. And then there's a whole other side that are into the dark mm -hmm. realm. And they're involved in, in some nefarious things and activities that impact many lives. And unfortunately, um, the ends justifies the means for them. Mm -hmm. And we know that the famous Freemason motto, order out of chaos, is something that they utilize to bring about change as necessary through the Hegelian dialectic process, mm -hmm. which they've been using for hundreds and hundreds of years in order to entertain people on how they want to move forward and, and create history uh, through their through their known changes. Mm -hmm. That's true. And lots to unpack there. Pardon? There's a lot to unpack and uh, all of that. It, it really is. I mean, we could just go on forever about this and um, and heartbreaking. Everything just leads to a heartbreaking trail, but. To take us back to the White Lodge, Blue Lodge, Black Lodge real quick. Um, so if if someone were to be inducted into a White Lodge, they know from the ground up um, that they it's a Luciferian, right? Well, I don't know no. because I can't, I can't say that I've ever experienced a, um, a ritual for being brought into Freemasonry in a White Lodge or even a Blue Lodge. I, I never took that step, that the Lord plucked me out before I made that decision. Amen. So th there is some things that do take place in regards to death and resurrection, which we also see in the Christian faith, you know, in baptism. baptism you yeah. are immersed in death and you rise out of that and mm -hmm. with, a, with a new creation. Um, they have a similar thing. So there's a counterfeit for everything within um, God's government. Yeah. And this 
government that uh, has been set up by by Satan. Mm -hmm. um, Lucifer is is Satan. Um, he is a fallen being, and uh, many of the people that I came in contact with um, don't see him being represented properly, and that he's a misrepresented uh, being as part of this uh, pantheon of gods, mm -hmm. uh, because it's the idea through spiritualism, um, and we we see that this idea that you have a soul and they believe that you have a living soul that is reincarnated at the time of a material death within the body. And that soul transcends either into another life or transcends into an esoteric body of light. Mm -hmm. And so at my young age, when I was doing transcendental meditation, it was my effort to meet these beings of light who I believed were dead ancestors. Um, that had reached this Mahatma or this enlightenment that they didn't need a physical body anymore, that they became bodies of light and that they were going to be working together with us, um, those who were in tune to their cosmic uh, calling to bring this world into what's called the dawning of the age of Aquarius. And that's the sign I was born under. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was being groomed to be part of this uh, bringing people into this enlightenment period that we're now entering into uh, through their teachings. Um, we're also going to see on the other side, there's a great reformation taking place with God's people, and many of them are waking up to the mm -hmm. fact of what's really going on in the world today. Mm -hmm. So the White Lodge in and of itself, um, with my father and his uncle, was they were brought up in a militant boarding school on the border of Tibet. So they spent nearly nine months of the year in this boarding school that was, um, it was a Catholic school. It was run by the Frankenser uh, friars and it had the Jesuit teachings. But what they did was very interesting, my father had told me, was that they would make uh, pilgrimages or homages over into Tibet to the great monasteries and, and visit some of these places where Sufism, mm -hmm. which is the melting pot of all these mystic religions, was being practiced. Mm -hmm. And so they were being basically broken as young men, and then they were being recreated mm -hmm. into this ability to receive these powers, these uh, esoteric powers. So my dad shared with me on a number of occasions, they would go to these prayer temples, and there would be people levitating, uh, in full mantra positions, mm. 30 to 40 feet off the ground. Mm. Um, so there was this understanding is that you can see this, now you can become a part of it. And that was what was led in through me in regard to my early ages of discovery when I started to, to dabble in um, really kundalini yoga, um, which is uh, in and of itself probably, um, how do you want to say this? It's it's a religion of itself. It's Hinduism at the core in regards to the teaching. Mm -hmm. It's built on a serpent power. That's right. You've got a dragon within, mm -hmm. and you're trying to unleash that power, and you're invoking your chakras. Mm -hmm. And if you start to peel this onion open, you will see that the chakras are related to the seven visible sky planets within our solar system which are they're connected to the seven days of the week and which are connected into astrology. Mm -hmm. And so Satan's number one religion from the very get-go has been astrology. And he's the serpent in the wheel. He's the sun god in the center of the horoscope wheel. And the 33 rooms within the 12 houses surround him. Mm -hmm. And that's where that number 33 times 12 uh, gets you to 36. And then you use the magic square, uh, which came out of Babylon, to do your astrology charting. And that's where the number 666 originated from. Uh, not very very curious Philae Day, um, which it can also. Mm -hmm. um, but in reality, it's at the core of their teaching, which is sun worship. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned earlier, um, one of the defining uh, marks of God's remnant people are those who are going to keep his holy Sabbath day. So here again, Lucifer, Satan, needs his day of worship. Mm -hmm. He's the sun god. 
he's trying to bring everybody under his control to bring in this either green Sabbath, which is being called now, or this idea that um, you know the world is coming to an end and we need to to give a day of rest, and they're trying to put forward this Sunday worship. Yeah. So two great errors, the immortality of the soul and the Sunday sacredness, that's the, the, the net which is going to bring all these people under control and to be deceived at the very end. And, mm -hmm. and most, unfortunately, of Adventism are going to fall into that net. That's what we're told. Yeah. Most of the people are outside of the church. Most of the people who will be saved are outside of our church and will be coming into the Sabbath message. Amen. So, that's that mm -hmm. multitude. Yep, that's going to come in at the very end yeah. during the Elijah message that's going to be proclaimed. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, so your grandfather was William Booth or great-grandfather? Uh, my, my grandfather married uh, uh, into the Booth family through cousins. Okay. So... Um, Part of what originally, when I, I first started to unpack my family history, um, I made a misstatement, and actually my father was the one that corrected me on it, um, that we married into the Booth family. And what I had said is that there was actually an adoption that took place, and that was an incorrect statement. So he was the one that came forward to me and said, Mark, I need you to understand, um, we were cousins with the Booth family. Um, my grandmother was involved with the Salvation Army in some respects. That was part of what they were doing within the government as well. And if you look historically at where the uh, Salvation Army not only got their uh, funding from, but the actual logo itself mm -hmm. um, is the Red Shield. Uh, in German means Rothschild. And so there are documents that you can find that say that the Rothschilds were involved in most of Christendom and in, in funding events. And so here we saw that the Booth uh, ministry through the Salvation Army had gone to the Far East in order to um, not only capture what they can in regards to saving lost souls, but there was other uh, connections, if you will, into the East India Trading Company. If anybody's familiar with what they did in the Far East, they were the largest opium trafficker at the time. And so we see a lot of different tentacles to the octopus in regards to how institutions are used as front organizations in some cases. Now to William Booth's benefit, I mean, he came out and publicly stated that uh, no member of his staff could ever be a member of a secret society. Um, it's very challenging, though, to uh, look at some of his portraits, and he stands with a hidden hand in his inside of his lapel, mm -hmm. which is outwardly the symbol of uh, Freemasonry. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the Lord is going to be his judge. I believe that uh, God will will uh, do what is necessary in regards to the life and 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 what what William did. Um, but we see this across many different uh, platforms where uh, agencies are used as front organizations. Um, and again, here is a Christian movement, um, but it was bringing people to the wrong way of worship. Mm -hmm. um, they were helping the downtrodden individuals. Uh, they were pulling people out of you know, slums. They were pulling people out of bars, mm -hmm. out of prostitution. And they were bringing them into places where they could try to make these people have a better life and, and look towards Jesus as their savior. Mm -hmm. uh, quickly, just to share with you, um, there has been uh, a number of people within the Salvation Army Church that have come over to the Sabbath keeping side. And so I believe God has a number of people within, you know, what the Bible says God's got his people everywhere. Mm -hmm. I believe a number of people are going to come over to the Sabbath keeping side and realize that the truth is what sets you free. Yeah. And when they get more truth, they're going to, they're going to come into God's uh, last day movement. Mm -hmm. Amen. And with the way things are going, it seems to be getting pretty close and that's going to be exciting in the midst of all of the chaos we see around us. We do have something to look forward to seeing. 
and uh, Amen. as you are sharing a little, oh, go ahead. You were going to say something. No, I was going to say, but to, to put that in, in its context, there's going to be a time like never was since there was a nation. And, and if we think that we're going to be able to get through that before Jesus comes, then we, we need to be prepared for the storm first. Mm -hmm. and, and our, our brother in Christ is the one who says, I'm going to take you through the storm. Mm -hmm. um, so I know a lot of people that keep saying, oh, Jesus is coming soon. And yes, he is. But before he comes, it's going to be ugly. Mm -hmm. It's going to be complete uh, chaos, mm -hmm. not only within the world environment, as we see in Matthew 24, the earthquakes in diverse places, the pestilence, the famine, mm -hmm. but we're going to see the wars and rumors of wars. And, you know, at the very first onset, Jesus says, don't you be deceived by any man. Mm. So within our organization of Adventism and every other one, we need not to look towards our pastors. We need not to look towards our denominational Pharisees, we need to look towards the Bible and the Bible alone. That's our faith. Yes. Um, and fidelity to God is, is our motto. That's right. That's right. And today when there's an allegiance of our kids, especially towards the youth pastors, um, it, it's, uh, we have much to pray about in, um, in breaking that stronghold and allegiance to man versus the Word of God. Amen. And not only is the Word of God says to watch, pray, watch, it says we're to work. Mm -hmm. Jesus came to save that which was lost, mm -hmm. and he was about the Father's business. And it's coming to this understanding, how much are you willing to give up in order to save your fellow man? Mm -hmm. Are you willing to sacrifice yourself mm -hmm. in place that somebody else might be saved? And without Christ in you, that's an impossibility. Yeah. I think we're going to reach a point in our lives that we'd rather die than sin against our God. And we'd rather die than to see one soul lost to the kingdom because of our effort. Amen. Amen. There's a lot of, a lot of hard work that God wants to do in each and every one of us to, to prepare yeah. us for those days which are quickly upon us. I was going to show the viewer why we continue to talk. Um, okay. Works. Oh, there we go. So I was going to show them a picture of your family, the Booths, right? That's William Booth. And his wife, right? So they were cousins to my grandparents. We had mixed cousins within the, those, across those families. Okay. And then we have the red shield that you're talking about, the this, this symbol of the Salvation Army. Mm -hmm. Blue William Booth. Which is also, Booth. Yeah, the, the red shield in German is Rothschild. Okay. Hide and, things in and, plain sight. Yes. And then we have more. He was a 33rd degree Mason, right? So. Yeah, and there's a lot of, how do you want to say it, blowback. Uh, because of that, because you can't find his name listed on any membership oh. list. Um, and so I've, I've received a lot of blowback for, for making that bold statement. Oh. Um, and a lot of people have um, said that, uh, that, was, that it was something that shouldn't be presented without facts. Uh, unfortunately, within Freemasonry in and of itself, they don't publish their list of members. Mm -hmm. It's only done through the idea that membership is, is a, it's a closed society. Um, today, you might find membership in people who outwardly say, you know, that I'm a Freemason. But historically, that was not something that you went out and told people that you were a part of that secret society. Mm -hmm. So what you, your information was passed down through family history, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, that the, the Booth families were involved in as meetings that were taking place within the, the White Lodge. Okay, wow. So I have a question a little bit. It seems off 
off topic, but it's really not. Um, eventually, you'll see why. But we have this history here of this, the Salvation Army doing great things, good things, right? And seemingly being, bringing people to, to Jesus, while on the backside, a front for, at some point, at least running drugs, right? Did I understand that correctly? I think that you have to you have to parse it out um, within the society itself. I don't think that there was any uh, overreaching understanding from members that there was things going on, um, that it was part of a small group of people that were using it to their benefit. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's it's almost impossible to follow the money trail, right? Yeah. And so we see it today with the judge uh, whose son and hus son was murdered and husband was is in critical condition. Um, she was taking the, the law case for Epstein's financial empire and uh, his connection to the banks. Um, so the idea that you can find the money trail is, is nearly impossible, especially when you go that far back in history. Mm -hmm. I think it's much easier today to find the money trail if you're ever able to get behind the lawyers' shields mm -hmm. that control these banks. Um, but again, there, it's, it's the, the Hegelian dialectic that's at work here. Mm -hmm. So you create both portions of the problem. Um, you create the synthesis and the antithesis in regards to um, your control of the Democrats and you control the Republicans and you create a, a version of something that they're battling over, um, equal rights, uh, whatever it is, black against white, rich against poor, and you can control the outcome. So if, if you're saving lives and you're also destroying lives in the same sense, um, there's there's the idea that you're you're doing good in the front, and and I believe the Salvation Army has done a wonderful work, and I believe that God has many people in that organization mm -hmm. doing a wonderful work. Yeah. Um, but it's not our work. It's not the three angels' message that we were given as a church, and and I've pointed this out in my presentation. It's not something that we should be involved in in contractually doing work with them. No. The pen of inspiration explicitly says that we're not supposed to be involved with those who don't have the truth that we have for this time. Um, she says that it actually has becomes deadly poison to the soul um, to hold up these organizations and people who are doing these good works, but they're they're missing the plain "Thus saith the Lord" mm -hmm. and the idea of God people be identified for that. Mm -hmm. So I would probably say at this point, um, the global drug cartel is and has been steadily taken control by a military component of this greatest nation on earth. And they're the ones that are the drivers for the heroin, the opium, marijuana, mm -hmm. the cocaine. And you can look historically at the trafficking through the, the Bush criminal organization, the Clinton criminal organization, and all of these front organizations that get used for laundering drug money, uh, for moving drugs uh, internationally, and for peddling drugs um, on the street. Mm -hmm. it's just, it is a well-oiled machine, as John F. Kennedy said. Mm -hmm. uh, to think that you can just dismantle it, um, it is, is not gonna happen. I have a very good friend who's in the intelligence agencies, and he says, Mark, this international drug trafficking um, business, it's like a gigantic bonfire that's burning out of control. And occasionally things fall out of that bonfire. And our jobs is just to push it back into the fire and let it burn. Um, and he was talking specifically about our involvement as a country in Afghanistan and the amount of heroin uh, increase that took place after we came into Afghanistan. And we could see that historically when we went into Panama 
and the outbreak of cocaine within our cities. Mm -hmm. So there is always a, uh, a group of people that are, have an, another agenda in regards to how do we get people to um, see that we're trying to fight this war, but in the back end of it, we're actually the ones that have created this war or that. And what's really sad too, Stephanie, is this idea that um, they don't care about human life. Mm -hmm. um, the end justifies the means. And it's, it is a mob and, uh, how do you want to say it, mentality of, uh, of the mobsters. It's nothing personal. It's just business. Right, right. And I've had a couple of those conversations with my dad where I asked him, I said, when you know of these things, how can you be silent to them? And, and you know, to his defense, he was like, but Mark, when those things were shown to me, I chose not to be in, in to entreat myself into those things. And I said, but by being silent to them, you've condoned it. And he said, you can't judge me as an individual. And, and I believe my father is a good man. He would give his shirt off his back to anybody. Mm. And I love him dearly. He was the best man in my wedding. Mm. And I think that, uh, he's just been deceived yeah. by these esoteric beings, which he thinks are spiritual leaders that um, that he's tapped into from you know long time ago yeah. so we agree to disagree um and uh it's it's been a long journey it's in my 20 years within christianity in regards to trying to bridge that gap of what is true spiritualism and why the lie that was in the garden at the very beginning that you shall not surely die but that you would know good and evil mm -hmm. and and then to follow it up with that there is a, a Sabbath keeping people in the world today that take the law of God and they hold on to it as the truth and they have the faith of Jesus because they keep the commandments of God and they live a life that Jesus lived, mm -hmm. that they're trying to tell people to come out of her, my people, mm -hmm. be not because of her sins and not receive not of her plagues. For her iniquity has reached up unto heaven. And the cup is nearly full, as you said. Oh, yeah. And we're going to see things um, explode here in the coming months. I believe that we're going to see some amazing things happen in this country and around the world as we come into this presidential fall. Mm. And what's going to take place, uh, God knows. We just need to be prepared mm. for it. That's right. You know, I'm just struck by the duality between, well, in and among secret societies um, and and uh, new age religion and all of this good and evil exist and the only duality in the kingdom of heaven is right and wrong there is no mixing and um, god says you know he is light and in him there is no darkness amen and so when we think that we, I guess, like like Eve thought, she it was safe to take the fruit. It was going to be something good. She was going to be as God and growing in wisdom. People are truly, most people are deceived. You know, they're going into these societies thinking they're in a brotherhood or a sisterhood, if they're in the Eastern Star, right? Um, mm -hmm. Thinking that they are in the community doing good things a part of something greater than themselves. And then you have those who are not deceived and it's truly to become more knowledgeable, to interface with spiritualism and um, mm -hmm. and have powers, the counterfeit of the Holy Spirit, right? As Christians, we are given gifts and your gifting, let's, let's get to you. Um, we've talked a lot about a lot of these things, but you were being groomed to, to go deeper into Freemasonry, and you also had roots in the Illuminati, your family, your Illuminists. Is that true or, or no? Well, you have to look at the term of, of Illuminati. Um, in and of itself, if you look at the definition, it's somebody that is enlightened in some spiritual fashion. Um, the
American Heritage Dictionary in 1969 actually gave a very good definition. And, and then after that year, they took it out of the dictionary. Um, Illuminati is connected to Freemasonry. So Illuminati is a cell mm -hmm. of Freemason at the okay. core of it. It also defines uh, Illuminati as radical Republicans, free thinkers. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the movement that took place in the French Revolution, they were all part of this coming into this Illuminati understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, Adam Weishaupt, uh, which is probably the most famous, well-known Barbarian Illuminati um, component was somebody that was involved in the uh, inner teachings of Catholicism. Uh, he was a seminary uh, teacher within Catholicism. And in order to uh, blend and get into certain organizations and not be controlled, and I'm going to try to compress this very quickly, because um, there's a good book if somebody's in interested in understanding the history of this, um, none dare to call it a conspiracy. Uh, it was written back in the late 1700s, and it talks about what took place when the Barbarian Illuminati um, basically came into existence. There was another form of the Illuminati that came out of Spain as well in the 1500s. Um, so it's not something that's been around for a long time, um, but it, it is a cell of Freemasonry. And basically what it is, again, it's this um, rising up in the degrees mm -hmm. of your esoteric understanding and coming to the point where you're involved in Sufism. That's ultimately the, the acid test, if you will. Uh, we can see on the lapel of Albert Pike, who was uh, one of the highest ranking Freemasons globally at the time, he's got a Sufi pin on his lapel to show that he had reached that point of illumination, mm -hmm. this understanding that you can become and be involved in a godlike um, lifestyle experience, if you will. Um, so the the idea that the Illuminati is this you know separate organization is 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 really under the control in the auspice of Freemasonry, which is under the control of the Cabal, the Committee of 200. And you can actually look at um, the Queen of England as the matriarch of Freemasonry worldwide. So this this thing has so many layers to it. Mm -hmm. And you can go down this rabbit hole all day long and, and find all sorts of stuff. Um, and it's and it's good to understand for those who want to help people get out of it. Yes, that's the only reason we would want to know this stuff. It's to help others. Is right, and I've, I've had many people, I shouldn't say many, some people that came to me when I gave a presentation or did a testimonial within a church, and they, they were very almost angered at the fact of, why would you share this with us? And I said, I didn't tell you to sit in the pew and listen to it. Mm -hmm. You could have gotten up and walked out at any time you wanted to in regards to this. I said, but the Lord brought me through this experience because he's got his people everywhere, and he needs to call these people out. Right. And now we're seeing all these different people who are making these decisions that, that are impacting their lives, their families, their careers, and that they're, they're making decisions to, to follow Christ. And, and, and if I've impacted one life, thank God, because he, he provided that for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, as you said earlier, I had, I had a, an intercession from the Creator to save me. And because of that, I owe him everything. Um, and more so, the challenge is I owe him my free will, mm. which we all are challenged by trying to give that up every single day to him. Mm -hmm. um, say, Lord, take it from me. I can't give it to you. Mm -hmm. But this idea that there's all these people that have no idea that are deceived. Mm -hmm. And what their deception is going to be is to hear from somebody that's already been down that path and have escaped yes. through the power yeah. Christ. Mm -hmm. It gives them hope. It opens their eyes and gives them hope, you know, when that they can get out too. Because, you know, they it should, the ones you have worked with, I'm sure, were already in there. They had taken that oath. They were going up the levels. So they were in, a, in an even deeper grasp of this with 
you know, implications of losing their life and coming out as well. So yes. let's talk about what happened. How did you get out of this? I mean, you were, you were hemmed in um, through your through family generations. So it wasn't just you doing this. This was, this was, you were surrounded by all of this on every side. Mm -hmm. What, I mean, what happened I when you came out? To, to first frame it, um, especially now that I've come to see the bigger picture um, and the statement that uh, comes from the pen of inspiration in mind, character, personality, if the mind is not decidedly under the control of God, it is under the control of the devil or Satan. Mm -hmm. So the word of God says, let this mind of Christ be in you also. So to think that you can be on the fence or that you're in the middle, you're deceived. Either your mind is fully under the control of the blessing or it's under the control of the curse. And that's where I think humanity doesn't get it for the most part. And in many in the church don't get it, mm -hmm. that it is complete control of the conscience. And so what I thought as I was, you know, doing these different things in regards to my backgrounds and got astral projection, levitation, um, moving objects, all of these different things. I thought that it was me mm -hmm. and, and powers I was harnessing within me. Mm -hmm. But when I came to the realization that these are devils that have taken control of my mind and tried to get me to believe that I'm doing this by myself through my own free will and power, that was an aha moment. And so, you know, as, as the Lord was bringing me through the last parts of my career when I worked for, for IBM as a global company, and I had to make some serious decisions in regards to what I would ever do to continue on that career path. Um, and I had been uh, asked to be involved in some very interesting uh, work, if you will, um, and I, I'm not going to take much time to even talk about any of that stuff, but just the idea that there were things that were discussed or we did that you were required to forget or not to talk about with those outside of your circle of people within the organization. And so that wasn't sitting right with me. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm fully immersed in this, this ideology and this thinking of philosophy of metaphysics, the ability of uh, occultism in regards to harnessing this power, unleashing the, the dragon, the kundalini power within. And I was being prepped to bring this world into a, this new dawning of the age of Aquarius. And so it was exciting. Um, and, and the majority of people that I was surrounded by at the time were all... Um, very helpful, very friendly, uh, very much involved in trying to make things happen for me. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I, I realized that there was something that was missing in all of this, this peace that only God gives you mm -hmm. in regards to the reality of what's going on. And as I started to wake up to the fact of what was going on, I realized that the people around me really didn't have my best intentions at all. Mm -hmm. I worked very closely with a gentleman named Bobby, and um, him and I used to travel sometimes together. And one night we were traveling, we were out to dinner, a business trip, and uh, he said that, uh, that he was getting up to leave the table. And I kind of casually asked him, I said, so what are you going to go do? And he says, well, I'm going to go up to my hotel room and, and read my Bible. And I kind of brushed it off. I thought, well, okay, you know, that's what he wants to do. It's not my thing, you know, I've got my own thing that I do, um, but he planted a seed. He planted a seed, and as we became more and more friendly towards each other, and I was explaining to him about the things that I was asked to do and places to go and things to discuss within our businesses, units, um, he said, Mark, do you understand what's happening to you? You're being groomed, and he was the one that kind of opened things up to me a little bit, wow. and so... I went to my father, who was my confidant and friend, and I said, so, you know, Dad, what is this? What are these things? And um, what is that apron that 
you have? And what about all of these things that I can tap into in regards to my resources globally with other people? And, and so he thought I was fully on board with taking the next steps and, and being groomed and, you know, involving myself further and further, immersing myself into this kind of inner circle of people who think that they're going to help bring the planet into this new millennium. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side, the Lord led me to buy a Bible. And I started reading the Word of God. And there was a tremendous amount of um, angst between the one world that was feeding me my desires, it was feeding me my lifestyle, was feeding me my friends. And then there was this one person through the Bible that was telling me, Mark, I'm filling your empty spot in your life. Mm. And as that started to, to grow, and as I started to start to do research on the Illuminati, Freemasonry, my family's background, the connections with the people that I knew within the government, the drug traffic, all these different aspects that had been touching my lives in many different ways, um, I realized that I was at a crossroads. And uh, I had actually bought a home in upstate New York from a family friend. And uh, to this day, I realized that it was, it was part of the idea that I was going to be drawn into this net, if you will. Um, and interestingly enough, this house, um, the, the previous owner was a skull and bonesman. And one day I had somebody come in to do some renovation work on the property and we were opening up a wall in one of the living rooms and behind the wall was this, um, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, like shrine of uh, a Geronimo, a picture of Geronimo, which is the, the head and skull is what's used in the Skull and Bones house, is, is Geronimo's head, oh. was behind the wall with a knife stuck in the picture in the throat mm. and blood mm. down the wall. Mm. And the people you know, that looked at it and said, what do you want us to do with that? And I said, just get it out of there. Um, so I realized that there was something that was going on that, was, that wasn't right. And so God was tugging with me, mm -hmm. and and I had made a decision shortly thereafter. I wasn't gonna I wasn't gonna go any further at my career. And um, I went to my boss and I said, "Listen, I'm I'm out. I can't do this anymore. I can't look at myself in the mirror. I know I'm being manipulated." Mm -hmm. um, and there there were other events that were taking place um, in New York and New York City and and people that I was involved in with work. Um, and I almost felt like I was too far in, like they had the goods on me. Right. See, right. See, I want you to think that. Right. And that's what, unfortunately, many people believe that they're, they're too far in, they can't get out, or the Lord can't forgive them for what they've done. Yeah. And. Um, total lies from Satan. Total lies. Um, and so I gave my notice, and my boss said, you know what, listen, we, we just. We need you to work a few more weeks. Um, we had a big convention that was coming up. We need you to be part part of that. We've got a lot of things that you've been working on. And um, then after that's all done, you can take a sabbatical. And that was kind of the carrot that they held out. Mm -hmm. And I said, can't. I'm done. This is over. Good for you. And shortly thereafter, as I was up there in, in this cottage in upstate New York in a very remote part of the, the Adirondacks. Um, it was on a, a, a lake up there and across the lake from the house was the DEC barracks, Department of Environmental Conservation and the State Police Barracks were across the, the lake from where I lived and um, very dark spiritual area up there. Um, a lot of retired New York police, city police that have bought land up there. Um, and the land that I own actually abutted United Nations uh, land as well. Um, and one night as I was very late at night, I looked out off the back porch and I noticed that the whole place was lit up. 
They had their floodlights were on. Their, um, and there were a bunch of people standing on the back side of the building. And they were, I, I used a telescope quite often on the lake and I had high powered binoculars that we, you know, we had. And so I picked up my binoculars and I started looking across and I could see that these men were all in full Masonic regalia. Mm. And this is where it got me into trouble was there was actually um, with them um, what had been invoked were giants. So there was there were two giants that were among them as well. And these were, in my estimation, demons that had been invoked. Mm. And that evening they were there to not just frighten me, but whatever their intention was. And so I had realized that no one was there to save me or help me. Mm. So I dropped to my knees and I started to pray, Lord, I don't know what's going to happen. Help me. And I cried out. I said, help me. And a small, still voice spoke to me inside and said, Mark, I need you to go and take your shoes and socks off and go outside and tell them you belong to me. Uh, and so listening to that small, still voice, I took my shoes and socks off. I slid open the, the slider door and walked out of the back of the porch and walked into the woods where there were full manifestation of uh, Egyptian god Anubis. And there was these men in their regalia. And that night it was, in no uncertain terms, said that, that my soul was theirs. Mm -hmm. And as I stood before this manifestation of Anubis that was 14, 15 feet tall in front of me, and I was having this, um, it wasn't anything verbally that was being said because everything was telepathic um, because I was in that world. And so I was, I was able to get into the veil and out of the veil. Um, it was speaking to me in no uncertain terms saying tonight, Mark, your soul is mine. And he was stacking these souls wrapped in gunny sacks with their eyes cut out. They were tied at their head and at their feet. And he was putting them on this pile of these souls next to him. And the only words that came out of my mouth, you can have my body, but you can't have my soul. I've given it to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And this manifestation completely vanished. The men began to move away. And that small, still voice said, Mark, this is not your battle. Go inside and go to bed. And I did. The next day, later that next day, I got a phone call and I'm talking to my father. In our conversation, he says to me, Mark, as your blood, I'm telling you not to get out from behind his shadow, me and God's shadow. Because if you do, you're going to end up with a bullet in your head. And he says, and you can't be touched at this point. So I'm telling you as your father, don't get out from behind his shadow. And there were days after that that him and I spoke, and I had questions and doubts about the decisions that I had made in regards to following Jesus. And um, I had even asked him, I said, is there a place for me? Can I come back? And it's like, no, there's no place for you anymore to come back to. That, that seat is no longer available at that table. You'll always be my son. Um, and we came to a realization that we're very much alike in regards to our convictions. Um, and then there was a long time years that we didn't speak and my siblings even to, to this day um, I have almost no contact with them at all mm -hmm. uh, in regards to this decision that I made to break away from um, this relationship and that part of my life and uh, that was 20 years ago and uh, now you know I've been on this path and it's been a it's been a rough haul it's been a rough haul for my my immediate family um, and uh, it's been very trying uh, for them uh, to have things like this you know out on the world wide web mm -hmm. and have people you know say stuff that are like uh, 
you know, completely crazy, um, completely full of it, um, out of your mind, and then occasionally I'll get a call, an email from somebody somewhere in the world will say, Mark, because of your testimony, I know what you know, and, uh, and I want to fully support that what you did was the right thing to do. Um, one particular uh, that many Adventists are familiar with is a gentleman by the name of Roger Morneau, um, mm -hmm. who has since gone to sleep in the Lord, but he talked about a time where he was at the point of joining a satanic secret society. And um, he's written several books, uh, one particularly called A Trip into the Supernatural. And you can read and hear, you can read that book or you can hear his testimony is out on the internet as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I somehow, the grandson of Roger and I got connected um, by the Lord's providence. Mm -hmm. he said to me, he goes, Mark, when you shared what happened that night in New York, I knew that was the real deal because Roger had shared that with me on a personal level and he never said that in front of anybody mm. that they were these demons um, and that Anubis, um, the god of the underworld or the dead, um, was one of the ones that they would invoke in their satanic uh, meetings that they would do. Wow. And so it was those affirmations that helped me understand I'm on the right path. Yeah. And if as long as I stick with Jesus, um, nothing's going to come by me in regards to uh, an untimely death. Mm. Um, but the Lord's going to put away some of his um, some of his warriors before the final battle, mm -hmm. and others are going to take up um, the banner and, and carry it forward. And I'm just hoping that that there's the opportunity that somewhere along the line that there are people that I've touched their lives that this would help them to to get in with uh, the soldiers of Christ and and put the armor on Amen. and get forward to, to be about the Father's business to seek and save that which was lost. Mm -hmm. Amen. A couple of things, that was powerful, Mark. You shared some things I haven't even heard in your testimony and just, um, it's heartbreaking and yet it's, it's empowering at the same time to see how God worked. And Amen. you, you, you are basically a new convert. You know, we talked about how we're coming into, into these times and we're, we're going to have to have the faith of Jesus and have um, his strength to be able to face these times. But your testimony of coming out of this, making your decision at such um, a, a young a level of maturity spiritually, you were convicted by what you what you were reading, by what you were seeing, and you followed God's voice. Um, Amen. And and God protected you. So no matter where we are in our spiritual walk, if we remain committed, God will help us. And think that we need. So I think that's very encouraging, and um, and I know He's. I know these last 20 years have been spent deepening your relationship with him and, um, and you know, to that full grown maturity, which, you know, it's a lifetime, right? But you're certainly mm -hmm. more grown spiritually than you were at the moment when you had to walk out and face those people. And hey. yeah. And so, Yesterday I had, or a couple days ago, I interviewed a young lady who um, who was a Christian from a little girl, but who had a family generational um, history of Druid priestess and witch, witches and saw the supernatural and demonic activity happening as a child in the home. Her mother, when she couldn't sleep and was being... Um, harassed by the demons, would call this little girl into her room to pray for her. Amen. And the demons would flee. The power of a six-year-old child 
with genuine prayer and a conviction of Jesus Christ as her savior. The power that we can walk in. And then I think about years of transcendental meditation that you were um, were doing and, and I was in the form of contemplative prayer. But as a child, you would come home from school, go to your room and meditate for like 20 minutes, right? The transcendental meditation and levitate. Mm -hmm. so there's, there was a power in that that was from another side. But when I contrast, when I look in terms of contemplative prayer, which was my background, it's the same thing as transcendental meditation. It's that alpha brainwave pattern. You had yep. demons speaking to you. You had spirit guides manifesting themselves to you, the spiritualism. And, and this six-year-old girl had the power of God. And so I think that is just a stark contrast and a beautiful picture of two different kinds of powers, um, one into salvation and another one to eventual death. And, and I mean, eternal death. Yes. So it's, um, now Mark with your, with your, oh, I'm going to show them a picture of Anubis. I, I, um, I saved that. I want them to see it. This thing was 12 to 15 feet. You said 14 to 15 feet tall. Yes. Yeah. And it's, um, it, what does his name mean? death oh it's um opener of the ways is what you can see there in the definition um so it's this ability to to pierce the veil and to get into the the underworld the spiritual world and really this is just to to get you connected with fallen angels mm -hmm. now that i know who they are right and you read down there in that second paragraph its relationship to um, the solstice. And so here we see again the, the wrapping in of astrology into the teaching as well. Uh, so the personification of the summer solstice. Uh, and we see that um, part of the Druid wheel, you just mentioned that young girl and the family's connection, uh, the Druid wheel in and of itself lays inside of the horoscope as well. So you've got the eight sabbats of Buddhism, you've got the worship of the grove, all of those things are all part of the same system, which, um, you know, liken it to that there are many threads to the rope, um, that the noose that Satan's trying to put around each and everybody's throat, that he can draw into this um, fake uh, system that he's created. It's not a fake system. It's a system of deception. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mark, is there a reason you haven't written a book? I've been asked several times, and uh, there was a publisher in England that actually came to me and asked me to write a book too. And I think um, I've really struggled with how this impacted my family and how my siblings and my parents um, were impacted about what happened. Um, so my first testimony that was aired and then it was somebody posted it to the internet. Um, it went out and made uh, a million hits mm. and it was taken down. Um, but it, it really, it really hurt a lot of people. And that wasn't the intention at all. Um, and that was part of my early walk as a Christian was um, I thought I had to, you know, turn on the lights and show everybody, you know, the darkness that they were in. And I went about it the wrong way with my family. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that if I were to write something, it would be um, hurting them more, even more. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that they specifically my brother and my sister, my younger sister and my older brother, um, that God still has a plan in their lives, um, specifically to save them. And, um, and if I had done anything to thwart that effort, um, 
I'm very saddened by that fact that I would have had done something that would have um, disrupted that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the, the main reason why I held back if ever sitting down and writing something, it, it became just as powerful as it became a video in some respects. Mm -hmm. um, I could have gotten into a lot more detail, done a lot of other rabbit holes yeah. in my life. And um, I liken it to this idea, you know, Alice in Wonderland, how far down do you really want to go? Um, you know, the Andy Warhol paintings done back in the 60s of the car crash and how we slow down as we come to the car crash, not because um, we have an interest to help, but we have an interest to understand. And, and, and so I thought by exposing more of the, the detriment in my life, it would become more of a problem. Mm -hmm. I, there's still time. I don't know if the, uh, the in that door or not. I never got leads, and I, I I'm sure that in my experience, uh, God made it very, very clear I was to write a book out in my my story, and that's what I did, and mm -hmm. and He will do the same for you and others who are to do that. So, um, I really appreciate. The sensitivity towards your family um, that is our first our first mm. missionary effort I think our home and the family and um, from there it goes out uh, into the world and so you are in my estimation um, for what it's worth uh, you're honoring God you're honoring your family and and yet there are ways that your testimony is getting out there and touching lives so I know it's making a difference, and and you have had people contact you who have come out, right? When you're speaking, yeah. So I had a recent pastor um, here in the Northern New England Conference, where we we live up in New England, Northern New England. Um, I never knew who he was, and he said, "Mark, your testimony brought me back to the church," and ultimately he became a pastor in the church. Wow. And, it's a flock of people up here, and, and so I'm just thankful that God is able to use, you know, somebody as feeble and as me to uh, to, to bring about changes in people's lives that um, that feel that, that that they may be on the edge and that there's no turning back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Satan, that's one of his greatest tools to keep us in fear. If he can't keep us by will, he will keep us by force in fear, and so. Your life stands um, as a testimony against walking in fear uh, and, and, and rather walking in faith. And so does Rogers. You know? Yes. And, um, and you know, it's been interesting because there are unfortunate some people within the denomination um, because of their lack of understanding or even some who are, who are Masonic within the denomination. Um, have thought of, that it was their effort to to destroy my character, um, and I've had some tremendous um, character assassinations done mm -hmm. on me, mm -hmm. um, in regards to who I am. Now I'm not perfect, and and God, uh, you know, was working with me. Sanctification is a work of a lifetime, mm -hmm. and, and there have been times that I've tripped and fall, um, but He picks me up and carries me forward, and and I first I was very angry at those who thought it was their business to, to tear down um, who I was. And slowly I've become to this conclusion, um, one, that they project what's going on in their own life, but secondly, um, that I'm saddened by the fact that, that that's their Christian character. Mm -hmm. it's, to lifting up or praying for, it becomes this um, throwing mud and, and tearing down. Yeah. And, um, you know, God has taught me uh, to, to keep away um, from that negative uh, negativity that people have in regards to what the Lord has brought me through. You know, it's so divisive and and mm -hmm. your testimony will serve to solidify people where they are or wake them up 
and um, and help move them away from those things. And um, so it's powerful. And I love the way you've come around to look at it because I'm, I'm beginning to get some backlash too, and it's hurtful. Um, mm -hmm. So when they don't sit down, they take the time to sit down and talk to you about your experience. But it's... Um, it's really an age-old Jesuit tactic, right? If you can't, yeah. if you can't prove what they're saying is a lie because it is true, um, then you assault their characters. You move into right. character assassination, and that is one of their methods. So it's yep. confirming that you are speaking truth when you when people do that. But I'm well, you know, we talked about this at another time where so as people come to know the truth and they come to understand the, the message that um, God's last day people have is where do you take them to? Um, and that's the quandary. Um, right now I'm working with a number of young men um, who were born and raised with an Adventism and they've left mm -hmm. and they see the hypocrisy and they see the mingling of church and state craft within the denomination mm -hmm. and the foolishness of the leadership um, as our uh, our leaders are now um, intertwined with um, things like the LGBTQ or the Black Lives Matter or things of this nature and, and the support of the Supreme Court decision in regards to equal um, rights for you know different ideologies and, and they're dismayed they don't they don't know where to go mm -hmm. um, and so you know we're working through some of those things now is god is calling a people faithful souls ellen white says in acts of the apostles page 11 that make up the church and something i said earlier the denomination is not going to save anybody mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Nope. Um, christ alone saves and for individuals to think just because their names are written on a denominational book somewhere that they're in the club is, um, is self-preservation. Uh, it has nothing to do with the work what Christ did on the cross. Yeah. Um, and that's you know, something in regards to these secret societies. Many of them are involved in workspace systems. Mm -hmm. They think that they have to do something in order to be saved. Mm -hmm. And in reality, there is a short thing you have to do. You have to give your life over to Jesus. Yeah. You have to accept him as your personal savior. And then you have to walk or run the race that he's put before you. But this idea that you're going to work your way into heaven is complete foolishness. Yes. Uh, God offered us a free gift. And I think that when we come to understand that that free gift is meant for everybody, mm -hmm. even those who don't dress like us or don't eat like us or don't meet on the same day as us, mm -hmm. God is going to work with those people at some point yeah. in their lives to help them make the final decision. And our job is to work with God's Holy Spirit to make that happen in those okay. people's lives that are on the edge of coming into the kingdom. Yeah. It's not our place to judge whether they're not coming into the kingdom or not. Oh. No, we're supposed to work with God and <laughs> cleaning out our own lives. You know, we need to be looking at us, at our own selves, and then praying for others, being available to others when they have questions. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's why I think, you know, what you're doing is, is a powerful ministry. There's, there's so many ways that people can now get connected, you know, through these different media platforms. And um, I think that the opportunity well, it's going to close uh, very soon. I think that these media platforms are going to get shut down pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, we're going to be in a time of trouble like never was. Mm -hmm. And so God is working to help within your ministry to get these different testimonials out to different people that are touching lives that come across them that have no idea, one, what Adventism is. Right. Or secondly, um, that, that Christ is the way. Mm-hmm. He's the way. Yeah. Yeah. He's the only way. Um, we could remember that, right? Moment by moment, day to day. I know. I know. And then, yeah. 
it, that is a challenge, you know, but when you realize how helpless you are, um, you, you tend to live in that mindset a lot more, you know, he becomes your dependence, your everything. And that's where we're meant to be totally dependent upon our Lord. And I think, I mean, I shared with you uh, a few days ago, you know, that there's a, a new journey or chapter in my life and, and, and the idea that um, um, our lives are a gift every single day. And so what we do with what we have, um, be it to the glory of God, um, is, is only by his grace that we have this opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the intention is as we walk this sanctified walk that we come to the realization that it's only christ and christ alone that that we have hope there mm. and it's not in and of ourselves that we can do anything in and of ourselves mm. um, there's a beautiful statement in regards to the the righteousness by faith it says where um, the pen of inspiration talks about laying man in the dust and doing for man what man cannot do for himself mm -hmm. and that realization has to be lived day by day, moment by moment, that God is the sustainer of all things. Yes. And if yes. he were to put away his hand, things would stop operating. And so we're just thankful that he decides to, to keep us under his wing and that he's willing to work together with us to bring about uh, the opportunity to bring people to the truth. And, and that's mm -hmm. that's the exciting part mm -hmm. about um, what we're doing here. Yeah. He wants to use us. And we yeah. get to be used, you know, right. and there's nothing in me. There's nothing in you except God, the, you know, the Holy Spirit. And he enables us and makes us usable. And so mm -hmm. it, to me, that's just beautiful. It's hard to believe and beautiful. So I want to talk or I, I, we've been a long interview. Well, we'll wrap it up. I want to bring um, I want to bring people to um, a statement that you made in one of your presentations, and that being, um, in your Bible, keep your baptismal certificate, and you also use a King James version, but a very specific King James version. Can you give us a little reason as to why that is? Well, when I went to buy my first Bible, I ended up at, at a Christian bookstore. And uh, the uh, shop manager, the owner of the place, I said I needed to buy the Word of God that was the closest to the original text. And um, he said, well, that would be the King James 1611. Mm. I said, okay, I'd like to buy one today. And he said, I don't have them. So I had to order a special copy of a 1611 King James, and that became my very first Bible. Um, now, I utilize these other Bibles as well um, electronically. Um, there's the ability for the, the writings of Ellen White and the King James Bible that's used within that application that you can put on your phone or on your laptop. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other part to your question, forgive me, was... Um, oh, what you keep in your Bible. Oh, yes. My baptismal certificate, which I liken to not only a marriage contract, but it's a birth certificate mm -hmm. um, through the death and resurrection performed in the baptismal service. And then the idea that I've, I've married. Um, we're part of the bride, and the bride is marrying to the groom, which is Christ Jesus. And so I want people to remember that if you've lost your love, go back to where you first remember having it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I find that the love that I have is when I'm witnessing for him. That's where I, I feel the power of God working through me um, by bringing people to the truth and showing them the word of God and the promises that are in his word. Um, there's, again, I, I fully support the writings of Ellen White, which is part of the baptismal certificate. And I believe that God raises up uh, a messenger when he raises up a church. And, and so the messenger for our time was Ellen Gould White. Um, she says, 
when a Christian comes into this relationship with God, that relationship must find expression. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't find expression, it will be a detriment to the person, but it'll also be a drain on that relationship that God wants so much to have with us. Mm -hmm. So it's important that it finds the expression and it's all about doing what he would be doing. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the history of what Christ was doing, most of his uh, relational um, things that he was involved in was one-to-one. -one. I mean, we read about the Sermon on the Mount and we read about the, the times he spoke in public, but ultimately, at the end of the day, his, his mission was one-to-one -one soul winning. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we realize that that's what it's about, one-to-one -one with our Creator, and working with him one-to-one -one with people that God puts in our paths through these divine appointments, that we have opportunities that, that can envelop us and, and give us this, it's, it's a natural high, mm -hmm. that bringing somebody to the truth and having them have this understanding that, you mean the king of the universe, the creator of the world, wants me and wants to be a part of my life? Mm -hmm. and take care of me and protect me. And it's like, yeah. And when that thing happens for that person, and the psalmist says that we get to enter into the joy of the Lord, mm. seeing soul saved for the kingdom. And how much more is it going to be when he brings all of his children into the kingdom at the end of time and saying, well done and good faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Mm -hmm. When we can do that now, entering into the joy of the Lord by, sinning, by, by seeing sinful souls coming to Jesus, and giving their hearts to him. Mm, yeah. Beautifully said, Mark. God is so good. He is. And when, when we're engaged in this kind of work, our own faith builds. So it's not just blessing others. That blessing comes back. And that is just how God does. It's like he doesn't just work in one arena. He's working all over the place, and everything has a ripple effect. And it's Absolutely. all for our good. So I have two here, books here. I have one more statement, too. I want to say. Oh, yeah. You know, this idea that um, there's going to be a sinless people before God returns. Um, and there's a bunch of people that say, you know, that's perfectionism and it's impossible. I, I don't believe that. I think that God within you um, can do these things and, and bring you um, to be able to put on that robe of righteousness. Mm -hmm. now, that being said, um, there is a secret in the pen of inspiration tells us to overcoming sin. By helping others overcome their sin, you become an overcomer by the word of their testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. Mm. That is the truth. As you were saying, as we're helping people in character building by coming to Jesus, we're building our own characters. Mm -hmm. God is working with us by helping others. Mm -hmm. It's not about us going into some corner and spending all of our time in this you know, relationship only with him. It's the idea that the relationship includes other people and that we bring people to Christ. Amen. Because he is a relations relationships. So yeah. it's beautiful. You know, and he covers us with his righteousness while he is working out his righteousness in us. You know, changing our characters. So these two books I believe you mentioned um, were oh, part yeah. of your conversion. You had you had been reading the Bible, and um, you were looking for a Sabbath keeping church, right? Yes. And you were invited to a meeting, and were given these two books. Mm -hmm. And you read them in what? Two weeks? Three weeks? Uh, about two and a half weeks. Yeah. Two and a half weeks, and and these are um, these are heavy books. <laughs> They're powerful books. And yes. And, and God got them into your hands at a time you were seeking. Absolutely. I, um, just uh, as a quick note to that. So I was also researching and buying books on Amazon in, in this different genre of secret societies and Illuminati. And, and there was an, an author by the name of Will Sutton and his books popped up and I bought them. And when I reached out to the publishing house teach services in upstate new york it was very close to the land that i owned up there um, and so through a conversation uh, with timothy holquist 
he invited me to a convocation that they were doing over a weekend at their church in upstate New York. And it was there that we met on Sabbath and God had already convicted me of the Sabbath. And I didn't know that there was a, a Christian denomination that was keeping the Sabbath. I thought I was going to have to become a Jew in order to keep the law of God. Mm. Well, it keeps me. Um, I've come to realize I can't keep it. It keeps me. But when I got to the location, everybody had a Bible. And we were studying. And I said, this is, this is where God's people are. And before I left at the end of the convocation, um, Tim's first wife, Ariane, gave me a copy of both those books and said, you need to read these books, Mark. Um, and it was through reading those books that I was convicted that um, the messenger of God was truly um, inspired by God's spirit to write that material and why I put so much credence um, with the writings of Ellen White and the Bible as being my two sources of material to, to eat the bread of. Um, so yes, they, they were inspiring and I've ended up uh, through time giving hundreds of books of that away over that time period as well. So I very much like giving books away. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Another way to, to witness and share God's love because her writings always take us back to the Bible and she was very clear, um, the Bible her, her writings support the Bible. They don't take the place of, by any means, Zola Scriptura, you know. Um, I was going to read a little quote from her, uh, actually. Um, it's about secret societies. And then, and then, if you will, would you give maybe a closing comment on to people who might be seeing this, who might be considering becoming involved in secret societies like the Masons, or are already involved in the Mason um, society, mm -hmm. and um, what might you say to them? Okay. So she says, those who cannot discern between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not may be charmed with these societies that have no connection with God, but no earnest Christian can prosper in such an atmosphere. The vital air of heaven is not there. His soul is barren, and he feels as destitute of the refreshing of the Holy Spirit as were the mm -hmm. hills of Gaboa of dew and rain. Now, she says many things um, about these secret societies, but she also says that people who are in those societies won't be saved, can't be saved. Is that what she says in the end? Um, yes. Okay. She gets very pointed in regards to you cannot serve God and mammon. You have to make a decision between one or the other. That's true. This, this, this is it right here. One class is ripening as wheat for the garner of God, the other as tares for the fires of destruction. How can there be unity of purpose of, or action between them? Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be friend of the world is the enemy of God. No man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And that was in Should Christians Be Members of Secret Societies? And there's more she says, but mm -hmm. um, I think that's, that's good enough to, to leave it there. For people for now and uh, I, I would just implore somebody who's considering this um, to step back and do their own research in regards to um, what they're considering entering into be it Freemasonry uh, be it uh, being Wicca um, whatever the, the flavor of the choice is to step back and just take a look at it from a historical perspective of where this came from. And those who are already immersed into it that feel the prick of the Holy Spirit saying, there's something more, as you read in that um, quote, there's something more I can fill you up with that these organizations cannot fill you up with. And that's a piece that passes all understanding. And so I would implore those who are um, have this void in their life 
that they that they at least give a chance, not so much with meeting a Christian that's going to show them Christ, but going to Christ himself. And it's okay to get down on your knees and say, Lord, if you really exist, show yourself to me. Mm. And ask for that event to take place in your life. Because if God hears an earnest cry, he's going to answer that cry in a mighty way mm. that's going to that's going to show the person there is another opportunity here for you to take a look at. Won't you consider me? Because I know you. And, and I know that you're going to be more full with me than you are with the things of this world. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. And that's something that you very much experienced in your life. Okay. You were empty before, and God came in and filled you up. And gave you... Amen. Well, thank you for being here. I was going to show this to you. If anybody wants to see a documentary, Beware of Angels, uh, Mark's story is highlighted in there. And like I said, I will also add your, your presentation um, on your testimony to the link in, um, on my Facebook and then to the link underneath this uh, on YouTube for people to follow up on. Mark, I want to thank you for your time. We have been round and round trying to get this interview completed. And um, I'm grateful for your time today and for your perseverance. And, I know and this is come out easy. east, you have to make sure to let me know so I can have an opportunity to put your, your face um, into a hug and uh, get to meet, you know, uh, you out here on the East oh. Coast. I don't know if next time I'm coming West Coast. Um, I just missed you the last time I was out there. So I just, by, by literally a week, I think it was. And um, I was very disappointed. But you know, God's timing is perfect, and I'm trusting in that timing. And and yes, I still have questions. I have three pages of questions over here. <laughs> so yeah. out there, we'll do a live together. And, uh, and it'll be really fun. Amen. All right. Well, God you bless you. Her? Yes, absolutely. Right. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for this time, Lord. Thank you for blessing the equipment, the streaming, just um, the message, the, the content, Lord. Uh, we just ask for your Holy Spirit to move and to accompany this to the hearer for those who come in contact with this later, and um, may it speak to each and every person according to their needs, Lord. And um, we know that your word does not return into you void, so thank you that your word is living, it's powerful, and it's mighty. And I just ask that you keep your hand upon Mark as he continues to share what you've done and are doing in his life, Lord. Thank you for this testimony. Thank you for preserving his life. And we know that no one can touch us except it pass through you first. So just protect him and his family and, and those he cares about, Lord. We just pray for them too, Lord. We call all people out of darkness into your light, Lord, and, um, and into your love. And this I pray, Father, and I thank you in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen. Amen, Stephanie. Thank you so much. Thank you. I will be chatting soon. All right. God bless. God bless.